So when do we need engineers and what do we need engineers for? Respectfully, Chad, that's not what the commissioner's bulletin says. You can't put handcuffs on companies. It's really hard. When and under what circumstances should we call public adjusters? How in the world does that work? It doesn't. So we proceed on to trial. I don't want to pay so much that everybody involved in the process is bleeding off a little extra money and going to Disney World. Next segment is um, lump sum and exactimate. And by the way, I don't think I'll ever interview people. I'll just do debates from this point forward. So much easier. I don't have to disagree. You guys doing all the work. I love it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> lump sum and exactimate. Chad, you're gonna go first. Let's start with the, your general take on both exactimate and lump sum methods on billing insurance companies. Maybe if you have an idea or a recommendation, what's the best way to submit a bid? This is a real easy question because uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't. If I, uh, if I sent a lump sum bid from my office, it would be rejected wholeheartedly and the insurance company would turn around and say, no, we have to have uh, an estimate and exact made. So we, we don't provide lump sum bids. And when I provide an estimate of the damages uh, in Xactimate, they just tell me it's wrong. But there's a silver lining to that otherwise bad situation. I, I was, I did receive a bar card from uh, the Texas board and uh, I'm able to sue on their behalf. But I'll say even, even after the law changed in September of 2017, where we had to be, we being attorneys, had to be more specific in our notice, and I believe we're gonna get into that a little bit more later. Uh, we had to hone in on how much we were demanding for actual damages. And, and that's not necessarily a bad thing because the closer you can get at the start as far as the value of a claim with the insurance company, the easier it is to get it settled in, in the long run. I love that answer. And I hope every contractor in the room heard what he just said, because it equally applies to them. All right, it applies to all of you. What Chad said was, as a lawyer, right, if I give the insurance company at the beginning of the lawsuit a real number, not my number where I'm gonna win the storm on this claim, all right, but a real number, he's more likely to resolve matters. And when we wrote 542A of the insurance code in 2017 and got it passed by the legislature, that's exactly what we had in mind. Force the policyholder attorney to give us a real number at the beginning and put the pressure on the insurance company to dispute that, as opposed to the bullshit number that's three times that that we used to get from the you know who they are PAs earlier in the this whole hail litigation crisis so if there's one bit of advice I give to you as a contractor quit using insurance proceeds contracts and quit trying to win the storm on every claim give the insurance company your price whether you call it lump sum or a retail bid I'm not smart enough to know the difference. I know in the roofing forums, there's some big debate about which one is which. I don't know. I just know it's a price you're gonna tell my insurance company you're gonna do the work for. Now, might they ask you for a breakdown because insurance companies are so ingrained in Xactimate? They might, but if you have a contract with the homeowner that says, I'm putting this roof on for $18,000, and here's a breakdown, and I'm making a 40% profit margin. That's it, it's not outrageous. Show them that. And that, they're in a much tougher spot to refute that than they are an exactimate estimate. Another very popular form of billing in construction world is cost plus, especially popular among general contractors, especially in times like now when you cannot predict material costs, you cannot predict what economy a gas price is going to be tomorrow. So a lot of contractors trying to play it safe, they charge cost plus 20%, 30%. You take on that billing to insurance company. Yeah, my clients owe the competitive price to fix damage at the time of the loss. 
right, or shortly thereafter. Right, so I don't have a problem with a cost plus contract. Again, I'm not smart enough to understand all the differences. I view it as very similar to a retail bid or a lump sum bid. Right, it is a contractor actually telling us what they spent to replace the roof. And as all of you know, our ultimate payment obligation is the amount actually incurred to replace the roof. So under a cost plus contract, if you come to me and say, here's what I paid the labor guy, here's what I paid the material guy, right? here's uh, my plus, you give that to the insurance company. Now I know we're gonna argue at times about what the plus should be, but as long as it's in the same ballpark, all right, as what the insurance company comes up with Xactimate, right, I'm gonna advocate to my clients that they pay it. But you've got to provide them proof. All right, there's all this stuff about, do I have to turn over my subcontractor invoices? I'm sorry, but you do. All right, and under Texas law now, under the Whitestone decision, a federal district court upheld by the Fifth Circuit, all right, we have the right to ask for the subcontractor invoices that establish then in turn the amount actually incurred. So that's just the law in Texas and I want to pay what was incurred. I don't want to pay so much that everybody involved in the process is bleeding off a little extra money and going to Disney World. That's not what I owe. Well, obviously we've had a huge spike in material and services costs across the board, all services. I don't know of a, a single materialsman or service provider that hasn't complained about those cost hikes. The problem in our industry is when we have a date of loss in 2020 that's getting paid in 2023 or three years down the line. Sure, they owe for the value of the, of the covered claim at the time of the loss or shortly thereafter, and then it goes gray. Okay, well, what if they're finally sitting down to mediation after the policyholders had to force suit, then an attorney on the other side gets involved, discovery happens, and then I know one particular insurance company that's notorious. We're two years into litigation and their settlement offer is what they should have paid at day one, except not with our prices, what they think it should cost minus their deductible and basically the ACV. It's like, how in the world does that work? It doesn't. So we proceed on to trial. Now, actually incurred, this goes back to, okay, well, the longer that we make them wait, it puts a hurt on the policyholder because they are required to fix their damages. Under the policy, they have a duty to mitigate those damages, and the longer that you let it set, the worse it gets. Now. When you go to fix something, if you're paying out of your own pocket versus somebody else's checkbook, and that's not the greatest way to say it, but it's true, if the insurance company was paying like they should, all of the scope of damages would be covered by that cover in the covered loss. If you're having to go out of pocket, the likelihood that you can cover the whole, all of it, or you're gonna pay less or with a less scope <laughs> Dimitri, if I may, and I'll be real quick. Uh, I'll be quick on this issue. Um, when we have a situation where we're three years down the road trying to settle a claim, uh, and we know that the costs have escalated over time, we will evaluate, even though we take the position legally that we don't owe any more than the policy amount, we will evaluate the cause of the delay. We're mindful of that in our matters in our office. What we often see are matters where we didn't get notice of a claim for 18 months, or we denied a claim early, and then we didn't hear about anything until two years later when some contractor or PA trolled the neighborhood. So we have to be mindful of the reason for the delay. And if it's on the insurance company, the homeowner is protected, uh, and Chad's very good at going and collecting statutory penalties and attorney's fees in the litigated matters that he takes to trial. Everybody's favorite, overhead and profit. In your opinion, when contractors is entitled, when we can charge for it and it's legit, and when we shouldn't, or your position, overhead and profit? This is a very debatable topic. Probably why you chose it, Dimitri. 
But it doesn't make a lot of sense because even the commissioner of the Texas Department of Insurance has made it clear anytime there's more than one trade or service to be provided, O&P is proper. Now, why is it that O&P isn't being provided along with any other, any other payment on the claim? That's easy, you know. Nine tenths of the law is possession. Well, the insurance company has that money and they don't want to hand it out. <laughs> so that's basically the only reason why I can think uh, the insurance company isn't paying O&P because it's pretty clear more than one trade, it's owed and it has to be paid. And I defer all the rest of my minute and 10 seconds to Steve. Good, because I got three minutes all on this know topic. This answer. <laughs> I got all kinds of, uh, first off, Respectfully, Chad, that's not what the commissioner's bulletin says. All right, the commissioner's bulletin says that if GCO and P, general contractor overhead and profit, is properly payable on a claim, it must be included for purposes of determining the ACV. For example, 15,000 uh, sub costs, 3,000 GCO and P. You can't base the ACP, ACV on the 15, you gotta base it on the 18. That's all the commissioner bulletins say. That's it. Nowhere does it say that the insurance company has to pay GCOMP on every claim. Under Texas law, under the Tolar case, GCOMP is payable when the involvement of a general contractor is reasonably necessary. That's for purposes of the ACV. It's a subjective analysis. You just look at it. How many trades are there generally? You look at that and you decide whether it's payable there. Whether GCOMP is payable on an RCV basis, it has to be reasonably necessary and it has to be actually incurred. There are those words again. So that's when we owe it. Only when the involvement of a GC is reasonably necessary. The biggest concern I have is that the question you asked, when is overhead and profit owed? All right, and that's the question everyone asks, and that's the wrong question, because it doesn't differentiate between roofing contractor overhead and profit and general contractor overhead and profit. I agree, roofing contractor overhead and profit is owed on every claim, but that's not the 10 plus 10, all right? The roofing contractor overhead and profit is all baked into Xactimate. I'm sorry it is, right? You add up the line items, that's how it works. The two the items on the bottom, GCO and P, the 10 plus 10, is entirely different. And that's what we look at to say, okay, is the involvement of a GC reasonably necessary? If it is, we put the 10 plus 10. If it's not, we don't. And the contractor, the roofing contractor's overhead and profit is in the line items. Chad, take a minute back. If, if, if I may, thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll say early on, uh, I had a PA who had a claim, adjusted it with the insurance company. They paid everything but OMP. He asked if I could help. I said, sure, even though it was OMP. And it wasn't a mansion, it was a modest sized house. What was interesting is the roof covering, it, I mean, there were torn architectural shingles, it, 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 hail hits. Water came in, there was sheetrock repair, I mean, you name it, there were at least three or four trades. And on every correspondence and the conversation that was up on the roof or around the property was, we don't pay O&P, we don't pay O&P, we don't pay O&P. I sent a notice of representation. I get letters from the insurance company, we don't pay O&P, we don't pay O&P. Okay, fine, get it, you don't pay O&P. Well, at the end of the day, even though I was only going after OMP, they paid OMP. But before I took that check on behalf of uh, my insured, who by the way, they were expecting this guy to oversee all of the services that were involved in the repair work. He was an elderly gentleman and he was blind. So my question to the insurance company was, what, you expect him to oversee all the work being done to his house? So I made them put four OMP in the memo on the check. Look, there it is, I agree. If an insurance company has a policy that on all claims, they never pay general contractor overhead and profit, 
I will tell that insurance company that that policy or that, that condition, or let's say it differently, that position is not consistent with Texas law. I, I agree, that's wrong. If that is the position they take that we never owe it, it's wrong. Again, we owe GC O&P when the involvement of a general contractor is reasonably necessary. Um, do you guys wanna continue any more questions about OMP for each other? Next question, all right. Uh, next segment is third party involvement. We're gonna talk about engineers, PA, lawyers, and a little bit more about our lovely insurance industry. Uh, my first question, are current laws enough to deter insurance companies from denying or underpaying claims? Do we have enough laws, current laws, are they enough to deter insurance companies from denying or underpaying claims? In Texas, absolutely. If an insurance company in Texas underpays a claim, there is no shortage of public adjusters and lawyers willing to represent homeowners in Texas. There is no shortage of lawyers. So anyone in Texas who's the, let's say, victim of insurance company underpayment can absolutely find a claim advocate. So are the remedies available to those homeowners adequate? A homeowner who faces an underpaid claim in Texas can recover statutory interest at 10% per year, which is about to go up because of the uh, interest rates are going up. They can recover attorney's fees. They can recover treble damages if an insurance company does something knowingly. They can recover common law bad faith damages if they do something really bad. And if it's super duper bad, they can uh, recover punitive damages. So there's lots of penalties against insurance companies for failing to properly and timely pay a claim. And there's lots of lawyers out there who will take on those cases. So I believe there is absolutely adequate representation out there and remedies for homeowners to go after insurance companies who don't do the right thing. Strangely enough, I wholeheartedly disagree. <laughs> because if, if, the, uh, if there were enough laws, then it wouldn't be happening, right? Is that, is, that should be how it's graded. So if the penalty was hard enough, then the insurance companies wouldn't do it. Now, we talked about this at the beginning, we're gonna talk about it at the end, and it's what is the deterrent? Well, you can't put handcuffs on companies. It's really hard. The handcuffs drop straight to the floor and they could hit you on your toe. Uh, so what do you have to do? What do you have to do to the profit-driven giant? You have to fine them. Now, in the 10 years that I've been doing this, the statutory interest has never deterred uh, the insurance company from, from what I can tell. It's like, hey guys, y'all better, y'all better play, pay this claim and pay it now because the statutory interest is going up. <laughs> it's, it's never, it's, I have never seen a checkbook get, you know, whipped out and like, okay, let, let's get this done <laughs> because this is, this is starting to hurt. So that, that doesn't hurt financially. So it doesn't change the behavior. Also, the insurance companies, 30 years ago, this is a completely different deal, right? Storms come in, damage property, uh, people call their agent. And the next day, there's, there's service members out, they make repairs, the tree comes off the roof, the cars go get repaired, and everybody went on with their lives the day after. Well, 10 years ago, things really started to change, and these, these profit-driven companies have gone out to third third party consultants, how can we make more profit? Well, the answer they got back was pay less claims. And we've seen a huge difference in, in, in that behavior and they're denying it across the board and it's the squeaky wheels with third party representation are the only ones who are actually getting paid properly. Dimitri, in 30 years, in 30 years of representing insurance companies, I've looked at hundreds and hundreds of claim files, of uh, internal documents, and I have never seen an insurance company document that says, we are going to intentionally underpay and delay claims. It's never happened. What I believe has changed in the past year, 10 years, the time that Chad talks about, is an increase in people who are injecting themselves into the claims process 
and creating claims or fabricating numbers or increasing numbers that are leading to more disputed claims. That's why we're seeing these issues and that's why I emphasized at the beginning that we need to both come to the middle and if we do that, we're better off. The only exception to that uh, that I've seen was just recently and uh, Chip Merlin blogged about this. Some insurance company attorney wrote a blog that said insurance companies uh, as a strategy ought to delay claims and pay less through a war of attrition. And I actually posted on Chip Merlin's blog that day that I don't know who these people are, but that's ludicrous. No insurance company should ever do that, and no insurance company lawyer ought to ever advise their client to do that. So I agree it shouldn't happen, but I don't think that's the problem we got. I would agree with Steve that that probably wasn't written down. <laughs> Um, all right, Steve, you mentioned- And if it was, they didn't give it to me when I asked <laughs> So you've never seen that document before either, have you? No, I just, I've gone off historical behavior. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm gonna insert here, Steven, you mentioned uh, people who inserted in the process, some of those people are engineers, and we'll talk about them. Engineers actually got caught in even jail time for faking reports, for insurance companies. So let's talk about engineers. When do we need engineers as organization? In our case earlier, um, you know, show me how to repair it. Who should show how to repair? Is it engineer? Is it manufacturer app? So that's my question. So when do we need engineers and what do we need engineers for? Because insurance adjusters act like not as experts and they don't take roofers or contractors expertise. So when do we need engineers? Yeah, engineers uh, are utilized on my side, on the insurance industry side, whenever specialized knowledge is necessary to evaluate the existence of damage. Adjusters are generalists. Most adjusters see a foundation on Monday, a roof on Tuesday, a faulty uh, toilet on Wednesday, and a fire on Thursday. So they don't necessarily have all the knowledge to understand all building components. So we use engineers to help evaluate damage, just like on the policyholder side, they're used as well. We are using more and more construction consultants to assist us with construction related issues. Uh, so we will bring in an actual contractor to help us understand the construction related issues. So when we have disputes, there is a role for an engineer, there is a role for a construction consultant, often a real contractor, I go to contractors all the time in the industry and say, give me the real scope of damage, what you would actually repair and what you would charge to do it. These aren't just theoretical guys. These, guys who, these are guys willing to stand behind the work, do it, and say that I will stand behind it at the end. So there is that role. Now, what I've never seen, right, I've never seen in one of my matters, and maybe they're telling them without documents, but I have never seen an insurance company tell an engineer to change an opinion in a report from pay to no pay or something like that. That's never happened in any of my matters. Did it happen in the one scenario with Hurricane Sandy that we're still talking about 20 years later? It did, all right? And those people paid a really high price for that, but I've not seen that. And I'll tell you, if somebody in the room has, all right, you can give me an example uh, of an engineer who has changed his opinion at the request of an insurance company, you should absolutely call them out. And send it to me. <laughs> I believe that uh, insurance companies use engineers as a deterrent. They basically parrot exactly what the insurance company adjuster found in the first place. And I say it's a deterrent because here you have a professional engineer with a stamp. Uh, and for most policyholders, that's good enough. Because especially in Texas, people are trusting. And basically, how your insurance company performs is a reflection on your decision making. So you're always hoping for the best because you're the one who chose that insurance company. So you wanna believe what they're saying, even if like 
if you have State Farm and State Farm next door, it's, their claim's going terrible, you still, for whatever reason, believe that yours is gonna be okay. Now, when you get something back from the insurance company that says, hey, your claim's so important to us that we sent an engineer out to make sure that we got it right, and then they believe it, except those findings were nothing more than puffing and, and reflecting exactly what the insurance adjuster wanted to come up with in the first place. Now, in, insurance companies also, I've seen, this doesn't happen as often, but they also bring attorneys into, into the mix early on too, and all of a sudden you've got a, defen a defense attorney acting in the claims process, and for those policyholders that are receiving claims decisions on law firm letterhead, that's a huge deterrent too. They're like, oh, what have I gotten into? All of a sudden there's an attorney on the other side. This doesn't seem fair. They're not working with me. I mean, that's by definition adversarial. You know, and this I isn't find, supposed to be an adversarial process. And what I find on my side, you talk about insurance companies bringing in uh, engineers as a deterrent and to parrot what they found. What I find are PAs and policyholder attorneys bringing in engineers as an advocate to parrot what they found. All right, so it happens on both sides and it's wrong. We should hire fair, neutral professionals to help us get to the right answer. All right, so if either side is going out and bringing in their buddy who they know is gonna give them the right answer, the same answer, that's wrong. I agree, All right, but what I see uh, is not that on my side uh, and uh, I see something different. Now, with respect to defense attorneys getting involved early, I agree it's wrong. Insurance or defense attorneys should not adjust claims. But what we're finding is that when we have aggressive public adjusters involved, we're aggressive roofers, and now we have policyholder attorneys who are out marketing to all of you contractors, and I know they've come to you and said, don't hire a PA. I'll do the exact same job for 10%. All right, these first notice of loss lawyers are becoming very common and it's a problem because if there's a first notice of loss lawyer involved from the very beginning of the claim, then it becomes adversarial. They're lawyers. My client's gonna hire a lawyer. So Chad, do you believe it's necessary for policyholders to have a lawyer at the beginning of a claim before anybody even knows if there's a dispute? Absolutely. Good, thank you for that. And what's, I, this is a growing problem, guys. And I think you all know several law firms that are doing this. And who loses? The building owner, because they'll never have enough money to fix their damage. So give the insurance company a chance to do the right thing before you start bleeding off the proceeds onto everybody else who wants to inject themselves into the process. And to that, uh, yes, as an attorney, I do have to hire engineers, but it's after the litigation process has already started. And unfortunately, you know, it's one of the things we have to do to prove up causation. And if I didn't hire them, then I wouldn't be doing my job. My job is to prepare for trial and make sure that we are always two steps ahead of the other side. And unfortunately, when that happens, it does increase the costs uh, on the case and make it more difficult to, to settle it earlier uh, rather than later. All right. Next question was originated on TikTok by a famous insurance guy named Anthony. We have a few public adjusters in the room. When and under what circumstances should we call public adjusters and should public adjusters um, be involved? Because there's some people who think that we need public adjusters in every single claim and it's becoming popular, at least on TikTok. So you answer to that. Yeah, my view, uh, there's two answers. One, um, if it's a complex claim that the building owner does not have the ability to walk through themselves, I have no problem with the PA being involved from the very beginning, I get that. Other than that, if it's a garden variety simple claim, uh, a public adjuster should be hired after a dispute arises. It really bothers me when public adjusters sign up claims when there's no likelihood of any dispute at all. It's a total lost church fire. Nine million dollars, the building's on the ground. 
All right, the insurance company is about to pay the limits and a PA signs someone up and takes 10%. All right, what do you do then? That church is never going to be made whole because 10% of that insurance proceeds is going to go to the PA. And that's a whole nother issue. A PA cannot take their recovery from the insurance proceeds if they tell the insurance company all the work was done. That's insurance fraud. If, an in, if a PA is being honest, they have to tell the homeowner, hey, my, my uh, commission cannot be paid from the insurance proceeds unless you decide not to repair some of your damage. So those are my two scenarios when a PA, I believe, is properly uh, involved in a claim. And you'll never hear me say that there's not a role for PAs. There is a role for the PA in the claim process in certain claims. In short, when the contractor didn't get it done. Now, if it's a, if it's a, church, a total, total loss to a church that's valued at $9, nine million dollars and the insurance company offers 450,000, that'd be a good time to bring in a PA. I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> and more than likely it would be short-circuited to a, to, a, to a higher level or at least a different level, maybe one with a suit and a tie. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, independent adjusters that are licensed in the state of Texas. They far outnumber the number of public adjusters licensed in the state of Texas. They're, there's, there's less than a thousand, I think. There might be 1,200. Uh, but Texas has close to 30 million uh, in population, the majority of which own property. Uh, guys, we, we're outnumbered. <laughs> 53,000 all in adjusters, 7.4 million households. There you go. We're, we're far outnumbered. Any any time that the, the policyholder uh, needs help, it, I mean, it's always a good time to call in a PA or somebody to help. And, and whether it's a contractor, a PA, or an attorney, you know, I just say, don't, don't accept what the insurance company is offering if you wholeheartedly believe that it's completely wrong. And lately, that, that decision has been really, really easy to make.